All right, so to begin this topic of citizenship in the United States, we have to start at the beginning with, of course, the Constitution. Uh, adopted on Se uh, September 17th, 1787 by the United States, uh, the real power of citizenship comes from the Congress, and that, of course, is uh, under uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4 of the United States Constitution, uh, which reads, uh, The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. So from the very beginning, the institution uh, or part of the United States government that can declare who can be a citizen of the United States is ultimately lies with Congress. And their first time they addressed this was under the Naturalization Act of 1790. And that is actually in, in its entirety. Uh, back then they tended to write laws a little bit shorter uh, than they do today. Uh, now, the main things you need to know about the Naturalization Act of 1790 is that first and foremost, the first qualification to become a citizen of the United States is you have to be a free white person. Uh, that's in the very first uh, qualification there. Uh, secondly, you must have resided in the jurisdiction of the United States for two years uh, with a one-year notice period. You have to live uh, within the United States or a territory of the United States for two years, and then within one year of becoming a citizen, you have to give a notice of your want to. Uh, you must be a person of good character. Uh, can't be a criminal if you're going to become a citizen of the United States. Uh, you have to take an oath of affirmation to the Constitution, and once that is done, uh, you're a citizen, and any of your children under the age of 21 automatically become citizens of the United States as well. Uh, Natural-born citizens, uh, children of citizens of the United States that may be born beyond the sea or uh, out of limits of the United States shall also be considered natural-born citizens. Uh, now, if you remember back during the primaries of 2016 election, uh, there was that issue of, is Ted Cruz able to run uh, for the presidency because he was born in Canada? Um, and this is one of the things that uh, he pointed to, saying that, yeah, uh, his parents were U.S. citizens. Even though he was born outside of the United States, he was still considered a United States citizen under this law. Um, now, citizenship shall not descend to persons whose fathers were not uh, residents of the United States. So even if a, an American woman was to have a child with a non-American, that child, even if it was born on U.S. soil, was not considered a citizen of the United States because the father was not a citizen of the United States. Now, that law would stay in effect for about five years until we have the Naturalization Act of 1795. And pretty much the only things that were changed is what's listed here. They kept the part about the free white persons, kept the part about the oath of affirmation, uh, kept the part about the person of good character, uh, kept the part about citizenship not falling to persons whose fathers were not citizens. Uh, but they added, uh, you had, if you were from another country, you had to renounce your uh, devotion to that country and any title that you had you did not carry with you. If you're the Duke of York of England and you want to come to the United States and become a citizen you are no longer a Duke once you become a citizen. Do you renounce that title? Now you also had to change the residency uh, from five years uh, or from two years to five years and from one year notice period to three years. Um, up in that just slightly. Uh, then we move on to the next time they passed. This stayed in effect for three years, and in 1798 we have the Naturalization Act of 1798. Uh, and what keeps everything except that waiting period. It went from five years to now you have to wait 14 years in the United States with a five-year wait period. Now that's quite a big jump. And there's, there's a reason why that went up. This guy here, our second president, John Adams, he is a Federalist. His opposing party are, I might freak some of you out when I say this, but this was a real political party. It's called the Democratic Republicans. I know that's probably just blew a couple minds in here, but it was a real thing. Uh, the Democratic Republicans uh, opposed John Adams here. Now, in 1798, uh, a couple laws were passed that were collectively known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. Now, the Alien Acts uh, dealt with this naturalization. The Naturalization Law of, or Act of 1798 uh, was part of the Alien Acts. 14 years and five-year wait period. 
Uh, it also gave the president the power to deport or imprison foreigners or immigrants within the United States at his discretion that he felt were enemies of the United States. It did not matter if you were a citizen, if you were not born in the country, the President of the United States could declare you an enemy, throw you in prison, or ship you out. Just because he felt like it. That is not the problem. That's not the thing people had problems with. The Sedition Acts were what people had problems with. Um, it also made it illegal to uh, write, print, utter, or publish any false, scandalous, or malicious writing against the United States government. You could be thrown in prison for saying something bad about the President of the United States. You could not criticize the President unless you wanted to be thrown in jail. Overall, that law would uh, see 20 Democratic Republican newspaper editors arrested, and uh, some were sent to prison. Uh, most famously was Matthew Lyon. He was a, a congressman, a representative from the state of Vermont, who actually got into a fistfight on the floor of Congress and later um, criticized John Adams and was thrown in prison for it and was kicked out of Congress but won re-election from prison. Uh, <laughs> tends to happen. Um, but the reason the Alien Acts were passed were one thing. The Democratic Republicans had a large voting bloc with new immigrants. The Federalists were seen as elites. The Democratic Republicans were seen as the party of the working class, and new immigrants coming here were for the most part not wealthy. They were poor. And so they voted in favor of the party that supported them, the Democratic Republicans, upping that voting, or upping the citizenship requirement to 14 years meant they couldn't vote in the next election. They're trying to keep power here by suppressing the immigrant vote. And so that brings us to the election of 1800, in which you see John Adams came in third with 65 electoral votes. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr, both Democratic Republicans, tied with 73. And after uh, Alexander Hamilton swayed the vote, really, um, he saw... Aaron Burr, at, well, he saw Thomas Jefferson as an evil guy, but saw Aaron Burr as the most evil guy, and backed Thomas Jefferson. Um, and this is a time, really, when the second place, when the runner-up, the loser, became vice president. That wouldn't be until 1804 that we actually ran on uh, tickets uh, together. Uh, but Jefferson won the presidency, and in 1802, we have the Naturalization Act of 1802, and that repealed the Naturalization Act of 1798 uh, and put us back at the same levels we were at in 1795 with the five-year uh, living requirement with the uh, three-year um, notice period. And this really created a relaxed uh, immigration policy in the United States and a relaxed view of immigration in the United States. Uh, and this would really remain the law of the United States as far as citizenship is concerned until about 1850. Then we have the Naturalization Act of 1850 and the only change to it is that immigrant wives became citizens when they married American men. Didn't work the other way around. Um, uh, an immigrant man could not marry an American woman to become a citizen, but an immigrant woman could marry an American man and become a citizen. That was the only change they made in 1850. Now, uh, how are some of the American uh, people responding to this, and how are they uh, dealing with this as far as people already living in the United States? Well, we get a map like this uh, when we start moving west. Uh, every time the United States move west, they tend to find that people already live there. Um, and what do you do if you find people that already live there? You push them further west. Uh, so this is a map of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Uh, President Andrew Jackson signed it uh, into law, and this law would uh, force five native tribes, uh, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, and the Seminole, off their native lands and relocate them to territories uh, west of Missouri. Uh, now the Cherokee were different than the other tribes because they decided to do something different. They decided to actually sue for their right to their land. And uh, in doing that, we have this court case here, Cherokee Nation uh, v. Georgia. Now, they went to court in 1831 uh, at the United States Supreme Court. And the court found, uh, and that guy here is uh, John Marshall, the Supreme Court Justice at the time, and he found that the Cherokee were, domestic, were a domestic dependent nation. 
They were not United States citizens. They lived in the United States, they were under control of the United States, but they were not citizens of the United States, so the Supreme Court could not hear their case because only citizens of the United States can sue in American courts. So the case was thrown out. So the Cherokee went back and they found another guy. They found uh, Samuel Worcester. He was a native of Vermont and a missionary who was sent to live with the Cherokee. He learned their language and was adopted by the tribe in 1825. He decided to sue on behalf of the United States, uh, on behalf of the Cherokee Nation. He was an American citizen. He could sue in a federal court. And this time, they won. The Supreme Court found that although they were a domestic dependent nation, they were a distinct community with self-government in which the laws of Georgia had no force. The governments of Georgia and the United States were saying they had to move off their lands. The Supreme Court found those to be unconstitutional. The Cherokee could stay. Well, they still weren't citizens. They still weren't given all the rights of citizens. And then we get this guy. President Andrew Jackson. Well, the Supreme Court ruled the Cherokee could stay. But being Andrew Jackson, he didn't care. He knew what he wanted to do, and he knew how to do it. He said this, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. The President of the United States just ignored a Supreme Court decision and moved him out. Native Americans in this country would not gain citizenship until the Indian Removal or until the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. It took that long for them to be recognized as American citizens. Now, during this time period, we also have a great influx. Between 1820 and 1880, it is estimated that around 5 million Irish, German, Italian, and Frenchmen moved into the United States as immigrants. Now, what is one thing that all of those groups typically have in common, at least during this time? Well, most of them are probably going to be Catholics. And uh, that led to the hatred of Catholic immigrants. Uh, for instance, we have this guy here, Samuel Morse, the inventor of the telegraph, the Morse Code, named after this guy. Well, he wrote a book in 1835. It was called A Foreign Conspiracy, a Foreign Conspiracy Against the Liberties of the United States. Uh, the book is filled with anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic sentiments. And in the book he says, Surely American Protestants, free men, have discernment enough to discover beneath them the cloven hoof of the subtle foreign heresy. They will see that popery is now what it has ever been, a system of the darkest political intrigue and disposition, disposition cloaking itself to avoid attack under the sacred name of religion. Well, first of all, he's saying Catholics aren't even Christians. They're pretty much evil. Um... Pretty much that speaks for itself. Well, he wasn't the only one during this time. We had ministers doing it. This guy here, Lineman Beecher. Um, anyone in here familiar with the book Uncle Tom's Cabin? Written by Harriet Beecher Stowe, his daughter. He was a Presbyterian minister who in 1835, much like Samuel Morse, published a book. This time it was called Plea for the West. And in this book, he claimed that America needed better education systems. We needed to educate our youth. We needed to have the best education in the world for one reason. To keep Catholics from educating the kids. <laughs> he said in the book, by immigration and Catholic education we become to such an extent a Catholic nation that with their peculiar power of acting as one body they will become the predominant power of the nation or if not predominant, sufficient to embarrass our Republican movements by the easy access and powerful action of foreign influence and intrigue. I guess that's an excuse to educate people. Well, now we move on to a very important date here at the Polk Home. The election of 1844. And this date is important because this guy ran for president. James K. Polk. He ran against Henry Clay of Kentucky. And this is really one of the first major elections in the United States where immigrants actually played a pretty important part in the outcome of the election. Uh, 
but it wasn't without a bit of trouble from both sides. Uh, for instance, on the side of the Democrats with James Polk, we have the Plaquemines fraud. Uh, now, what happened was, during this election, Judge Leonard, a representative of Plaquemines Parish in Louisiana, uh, a representative from their state legislature, chartered a couple of steamboats uh, in New Orleans and took 350 uh, voters, mostly Irish and German, who could barely speak English, uh, gave them plenty of liquor to drink, and took them to Plaquemines Parish here to vote. They voted three times. Well, that's a case of voter fraud. However, the case was pretty much dropped quickly when it came down to New York being the deciding state in the election. Uh, everyone was focused on New York, not so much Louisiana. But the Whigs on the other side with Henry Clay also had their bit of a hand in uh, the immigration issue during this time. That guy there, William Seward, former governor of New York at the time, uh, who would later become Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of State, the guy who got us Alaska, Seward's folly, um, was accused during the election of attempting to sway Irish voters in the North to vote for Henry Clay by claiming that he was of Irish descent and his real name was not Henry Clay. It was Patrick O'Clay. <laughs> he would fight for them because he was one of them. Um, of course, that, that's not true at all. But Polk did end up winning the election. And under his administration, the United States would expand to the Pacific Ocean for the first time. And the largest uh, acquisition we got during this time was from Mexico. President Polk went to war with Mexico in 1846. 1848, we won the war uh, with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Once again, we're pushing west. There's people living in the west. What are we going to do with all of these Mexican citizens that are living in former Mexican territories that the United States now claims? Well, that's actually uh, mentioned in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Mexican citizens living in uh, the territories had one year to move, move back to Mexico. If they did not move, uh, they became citizens of the United States and gained all property and civil rights uh, there within. However, this was not the case. Uh, many Americans uh, began to flood into the new territories, uh, former uh, Mexican and Spanish property titles and deeds that were supposed to be upheld by this treaty were not. The lands were confiscated and the owners of the land were pushed off in favor of uh, Americans moving in to the land. Um, and this is actually something that is still argued about today. As late as 2000, the United States Senate uh, passed Senate Bill 2022. Uh, in drafting this proposed legislation, Congress made findings which, uh, which recognized the loss of property subsequent to the war with Mexico uh, has had serious repercussions in the Mexican-American community in the southwestern United States in addition, the proposed legislation specifically questioned whether the United States fulfilled its obligations under the treaty. Congress acknowledged that actions taken by the federal government as well as the territory of New Mexico in the mid to late 19th century were central to the disposition of Mexican-American landholders. Although not directly placing the blame, the legislation questioned whether judicial rulings in New Mexico and California were fairly and equally administered. Instead of addressing the problem, the bill concludes with an unmet problem promise to uh, remedy any lingering injustices from failure of the United States to meet its promises in this treaty. Once again, a group of people have become citizens of the United States, but are not, are given, but are not given the rights as citizens of the United States, because they are new citizens of the United States, and, and, and frankly, at this time, uh, not white as well. Now, Moving on, during this time, 1845 to 1849, under the Polk administration, something is happening in Ireland, the potato famine. Uh, millions died, and it's estimated that between 1845 and 1855, 1 1.5 million adults and children left Ireland and sought refuge in the United States. Most were desperately poor, and many were suffering from starvation and disease. This influx of immigration did not sit well with many Americans, and you started to see things like this uh, show up in newspapers. Um, as you can see here, we have immigrants. We have the Irish and the Germans stealing the ballot box. They're worried about immigrants meddling in the elections again, whether it's back in John Adams' time when he's worried about immigrants voting for the wrong side, or back in Polk's time when he's worried about someone renting a steamboat and letting him vote three times. 
Uh, but during this time, you started to see a vast amount of xenophobia or the fear of immigration uh, in the United States. Anti-Catholic sentiments swept through the United States, anti-Irish, anti, -Irish, anti uh, italian and pretty much anyone that's not already living in the United States a lot of people didn't like. And you started to see new political parties form around that. Perhaps the most prominent and the most famous were the American Party, uh, more commonly known as the Know Nothings, because when you asked them something about their platform, they told you they knew nothing. Um, easy enough. But you started to see things like this pop up, different Native Americans, as you imagine. And you started to see things like this. They were already voting for you, and they give instructions on how to vote. And the last line of this is, uh, be careful to tear off the top and bottom portion deposing uh, in the ballot box, uh, before uh, depositing in the ballot box. Um, they're telling you who to vote for. They're already voting for you. You just got to put this piece of paper in, but make sure you take it off so they know that the know-nothings did not give it to you. <laughs> now, the Know Nothing Party started to gain more prominent, more and more prominence during the 1850s. And in the 1856 election is really when they first made their first and really only breakthrough. When they ran one guy, they ran, no, that's a different guy. Uh, some more propaganda. Once again, they're very anti-Catholic, as you can see here. But this is the guy they ran, um, Alec Baldwin. <laughs> Looks a lot like him, don't it? Uh, Former President of the United States, Millard Fillmore, the 13th President. He was Vice President of the United States under Zachary Taylor's administration. When President Taylor died in office in 1850, this guy became President. He wants another term in 1856. He's not a Democrat. The, Whigs, the Whig Party dissolved. He doesn't want to be a Republican. So he became a know-nothing. He ran as an anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant candidate. As you, as you can see during the election here, uh, he ended up only winning one state, Maryland. The anti-Catholic candidate won the colony that was founded by Catholics. <laughs> he got eight electoral votes. Didn't really make a big dent. I still haven't understood why they voted for him. But he won 22% of the popular vote. He made a statement. Nativism was alive in the United States. And during this same time, a court case has been roaring for 11 years that has finally made its way to the Supreme Court. In 1857, we hear of a guy named Dred Scott. Dred Scott was an enslaved man, uh, born in Virginia, moved to Alabama, moved to Missouri, where he was sold uh, by his master to a guy named John Emerson. Now, John Emerson was a military surgeon who was stationed in Illinois and then later the free territory of Wisconsin. Well, Dred Scott went with Emerson to Illinois, then to Wisconsin, back to Missouri. Uh, Emerson died. Dred Scott had been promised his freedom upon Emerson's death. Nothing was ever written. It was just spoken. Well, Emerson's wife did not want to grant freedom to Dred Scott. By the way, she lived in New York. He's still in Missouri. Dred Scott did something that no other slave had done. He sued for his freedom. There was a doctrine in many free states, including Illinois and the Free Territory of Wisconsin, that once free, always free. If a master brought a slave into the territory, they were free the moment they crossed the border. Also, the people that owned him lived in a free state of New York. He was arguing that you, if you live in a free state, you can't own slaves. Just because he's in Missouri does not exempt them from that law. Made it all the way to the Supreme Court, where in 1857, he lost his case. Seven to two. Supreme Court Justice Joseph, uh, Robert Taney, Roger Taney, uh, wrote the majority decision. He said, in the opinion of the court, the legislation and histories of the times and the language used in the Declaration of Independence show that neither the class of persons who had been imported as slaves nor their descendants, whether they had become free or not, were then acknowledged as part of the people nor intended to be included in the general words used in that memorable instrument. They had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race. 
either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights to which the white man was bound to respect and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. He is plainly saying that Dred Scott cannot sue in a federal court because he is not a citizen. In fact, no black person in the United States could be a citizen, free or slave. John Marshall came with that when the, when the Cherokee Nation sued in 1831. So, Taney should have just dropped the case. If, if they can't sue, he can't hear anything about it. But he took it a step further. He claimed under the Fifth Amendment of the United States, slaves are property and therefore not even considered people. And since there is a property protection under the Constitution, no state, free or slave, can deny that property right to any person living in the country. He just nullified the Missouri Compromise. He just said that if you live in a free state, a slaveholder can move his plantation next door to you. And there is nothing you can do about it. Well, the American response was uh, different depending on where you lived. Um, in the North, we're seeing uh, newspaper articles coming out saying things like, uh, regarded, uh, as far as the decision was concerned, regarded throughout the free states and wherever the pulse of liberty beats only as the votes of five slaveholders and two doe faces. <laughs> Pretty much saying, the federal government has no right to come into your state and tell you what to do. And that's a northern state abdicating states' rights during this time. The southern states were saying the series of decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States in the Dred Scott case is one of more vital importance in reference to the settlement of the slavery question that any or all acts proceeding upon this subject, legislative, judicial, state, or federal, since the organization of the federal government. The South is talking about federal government supersedes state government. Now that's a bit different than everything I've ever been told. The South is arguing for a strong federal government. The North is arguing for states' rights. Bit different. Now, of course, going back to the citizenship case with Dred Scott, uh, African Americans would not be given any form of citizenship in the United States until after the Civil War uh, with the passage of the 14th Amendment which said if you were born in the United States regardless of your color, uh, creed, religion, whatever you are, you are a citizen of the United States. But that still left a question unanswered. What if you're of African descent and you weren't born in the United States? The law only states that you have to be born here. Well, it would not be until 1870 with the Naturalization Act of 1870, that foreign-born people of African descent could become United States citizens, uh, could immigrate here and gain citizenship rights. Now, of course, this argument does run up to 1860 when we do have a little thing called the Civil War. Uh, maybe you've heard of it, one of those forgotten wars like Korea. But this is as far as I'm going to go because this lecture could go on for days weeks. We're still talking about it today. It started at the founding of our nation and we're still struggling with this idea of who can become a citizen, what does citizenship mean, and what is our response to those people coming in? And this is where I end it.